anyway, I'm only using the mic because that's what's going to go out over Zoom. We don't need it in here. Uh, but what I told Buddy at the beginning with, he's uh, staffing one of the doors. So we're going to try to do a short business meeting first. We're reversing the normal procedure, and then we'll have the presenter second. And I wanted to keep the business meeting short anyway because we're holding Buddy up for the evening. So, And we do appreciate him doing this for us. And also appreciation to Vice President Dave Snyder for uh, contacting Buddy and making this all possible. So. And uh, as you know, this is the University of Lowbrow Astronomers. This is our May meeting, and we're a group of about 200 uh, astronomy enthusiasts. Uh, and uh, also just one note, we are recording and uploading to uh, YouTube later. In fact, we've been recording everything you've been saying all along since you walked in here. <laughs> we got you. So uh, being I'm going to do the business meeting, I just have two things. Uh, one, I'm just reminding everybody that next month, we're going to be back at our new location at the Detroit Observatory, only to July to move over to EMU, as we usually do every year. And then we'll be back at the Detroit Observatory from there on. So except for the July after that. But anyway, uh, and also, I just got handed by Doug Warshow a letter that came in. You might remember uh, when we had Brother Guy the last time, uh, we voted to send a $250 donation to the Vatican Observatory Foundation. And we just got a letter. I haven't read the whole thing yet, but it's a thank you for the uh, the uh, contribution. So that was kind of nice. So uh, with that, I will call on officers. And I'm actually going to step to the back of the room because that way I can see who's joined via Zoom. And that was only like one person. And that was Buddy. <laughs> OK, now we got some more people. So let's see if we have officers and we do not currently. So then I will pick on Jim Forrester. Member nights since the last meeting. Um, some of what we've had some member nights since the last meeting out at Peach Mountain. Uh, one of which was well attended and two of which were rather solitary. Um, but moving on, tomorrow night is uh, actually going to happen. We're going to have our first open house of the year. Uh, we need members with telescopes. So I expect everybody in the room to raise their hand. Gee. Um, we do need folks out there to welcome the public. Um, these uh, dates that we've uh, announced have been announced for six months, and I gave this little speech when we had the vote to confirm this schedule that people, when they were voting on it, actually were voting to come. So uh, hopefully some of you will change your mind in the next 24 hours and haul a piece of hardware up to the hill and help uh, educate the public about uh, the wonders of the night sky. And that's what I've got. Thank you, Jim. It is. Yeah, that's what they're saying. So although I did hear somebody say that the, the uh, forecast had deteriorated a little bit, but. Uh, Before I came over, Charlie. Yeah. Did look at the forecast. Um, almost every site within an hour or two of sunset, one, some before, some after, most before, uh, the skies will begin to clear. And so by the time it gets dark, we're going to have clear skies. Cool. It doesn't get astronomical twilight, doesn't end till around 11. So. It takes a while to get dark at this time of year. How long do you run the open house? Um, we pretty much will run as long as people want to be there, but I've been closing the member nights uh, at about 1 a.m. to be able to lock the gate at around 1.30. But these nights, um, if there's people out there that want to keep looking through the telescope, we generally try to do it uh, as long as they want to look. 
And uh, we've also solved the McMath operator problem because I went ahead and volunteered to run that tomorrow night. So we got that. Hey, answer. Charlie. Thank you. Okay, with that, I will pick on Vice President Dave Snyder. Get the microphone over there. Okay, so as you probably know, Jeff has been setting up a new website that will eventually replace the old one. And so both me and Amy have been copying um, some of the old newsletters over, well, old and new. So we probably have about 500 total newsletters from the beginning of the club. I'm missing about 100. Um, we've got maybe 120 out there so far. So it's been a process. So. Doug? Jack. There you are. Our observatory director, Jack Brisbane. Okay, just to make it quickly, uh, the materials and equipment we ordered last month for the observatory and that have all been installed and located in the, in the observatory and uh, should be ready to go for the open house. That's all I have to report. Thank you, Jack. Uh, Jack, did you get my note about the uh, gate lock? I don't think so. Well, what happened? The last two nights I've been up there, the lock has been through the chain rather than through the other lock. Okay. We, I, during the week, I was up there one day, and yes, I noticed that. They're, they're, putting, they're doing it wrong. They're locking it wrong. I don't know what. I, I guess I'll it take a picture. Us, but I don't want us to be held responsible. I know. Maybe. Okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send a picture of the one I took because I took okay. a picture of it. I'll send it to Sushla Fernandez and let her know that there's they've been locking it wrong. Okay. It's the best I can do. That, no, that's that, that's fine. Yeah, let's that no, that's a good point. If they're doing it that much, no, there's something wrong there. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And let's see. I think that's all the officers in the room, correct? If I miss somebody, yell at me. And I'm checking Zoom, and we don't have any other officers on Zoom. So does anybody else have anything that they'd like to bring up? Like Doug Nell's always got something. <laughs> Nothing? I was just going to say, you usually have something to talk about. I was giving you a chance. <laughs> Give me all your money. I don't think that's going to go over. But, you know, if you didn't ask, your chances were absolutely zero. They're still pretty close to that, but... Okay, so then we will just hang on until Buddy can make it back up here from manning the doors there, and then I'll introduce him and we'll get started. Thanks, everybody.
Okay, now we can get going here. So, our guest speaker tonight, although in a way we're guests of him, I guess, but that is uh, Buddy Stark. Uh, actually, it's Jeffrey Buddy Stark, Buddy being a nickname, but that's what he goes by. And as you can guess, he is the planetary manager for the U of M Museum of Natural History. And he took this position in 2021, taking over for Matt Linky, who has also hosted us, but over in the older building, you might remember, and Matt held the job for 32 years. So you got a lot of years to stick around here, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, buddy has worked in planetariums for years, starting as a student operator during his time at Olivet Nazarene University in Illinois. He moved on to work in the Michigan Science Center's planetarium before serving as the Longway Planetarium Manager at the U of M campus in Flint. In 2019, he was appointed a fellow of the Great Lakes Planetarium Association. Buddy Stark has a master's degree in science education and is, pending an update from him, currently working on his PhD from Western Michigan University. Did you get it yet? Cool. Uh, in a press release, Buddy stated, I am passionate about improving science literacy among the public. There's so much more to understanding science than what is taught in formal classroom settings. I want to help people of all ages to understand the world around them, and that can be done under the dome and out in the community. So tonight we're pleased to witness what he's talking about, and with that, Buddy Stark. Thank you. Thank you for that warm welcome. I usually, and I'm, I'm coming up here just temporarily so that you can see my face, because, of course, one of the problems with the planetarium is it's going to be dark uh, in a few minutes, and you won't see me. And it helps uh, those that have joined remotely. The camera is kind of pointed here, and so this is what they can see. Uh, of course, I'll have to control things from the back, so I'll be just kind of avoid. And that's why I, I wear this Madonna microphone, because a lot of times for shows, I'll have an iPad. And of course, you need a laser pointer. You're in a planetarium, and then you don't really have a third hand for a microphone. So that's why I've got... I got this guy. Uh, I'm also I'm going to close this uh, back door here. You're still welcome to, to come and go as you need to. If anyone needs a restroom break, this door doesn't lock, but it does help keep that light out. So so that's what we're doing there um, for today. I thought I would just kind of show off uh, the planetarium because uh, um, I think a lot of us probably haven't been to our, our new facility. Uh, and so just kind of showing off what it can do uh, and what we do for both the general public and for school groups is probably uh, a good use of our time tonight. Um, as, uh, as was mentioned, I do, um, I study, so my, my degrees are in science education, which at first glance feels like a weird uh, sort of field for someone who's managing planetariums. This is uh, my fourth planetarium. I've been in planetarium since 2008. But when you think about what you actually do in a planetarium and what you need to do well, um, it, it goes kind of hand in hand because really what we should be doing in here, um, yeah, which is right, that's kind of that's a good reaction there, uh, um, is the, the whole point of building these things. I mean, historically and still today is to find ways to educate more people about their uh, night sky resources, right? The fact that we have a long uh, and hallowed tradition of going outside as human beings and looking up into the night sky. The way that I like to start every planetarium show, and we'll do it in this one too, although I think you probably have a leg up on most of my audiences, uh, is by having everyone try to find the Big Dipper in the sky. So take a moment and see if you can spot that pattern. I'm going to adjust the camera so that our, uh, our online folks can see more of the dome here while you, uh, while you spot things. Oh yeah, well that's so that's actually that's why I start this way. And let me I'm kind of multitasking. I think I can adjust the where that with that camera is seeing, although it's really struggling. The reason I start this way is because you'd be surprised at how many people in the in the general public are able to find the Big Dipper without any help from me, right? Which is kind of the point, right? I, I'll say things like, okay, if you think you've got it, count the stars. There should be seven of them in the Big Dipper. So make sure your pattern has seven stars. And then I'll say something like, okay, if you're still looking. If you haven't managed to spot it yet, 
uh, there we go. Now I'm adjusting that camera so that our online folks can see more of my plant here. Then it's pretty high in the sky this time of year, and it's kind of upside down, and so it wouldn't uh, it wouldn't hold a lot of water. And then and they talk to each other, right? We have a lot of conversations. The 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 people in this room talk to the people they came with, and they help each other find it, and they point it out in my planetarium. And then I say, okay, how did we do? Were we able to find this? And again, for, uh, there's a lot of things in the sky that, of course, most of the general public can't find, right? I mean, that's just about everything except for the Big Dipper. Uh, but uh, I'm constantly surprised at how many people, even young children, can, if you ask them to, find that. And then by not having used my laser pointer yet, right, I can say, okay, you didn't need my help for this, right? I gave you nothing. You found this on your own. So if you found it in here, you can probably go outside in your own backyard tonight and look up and you don't need me there either, right? Uh, so it gives them sort of an onus and uh, it gives them a license to say, okay, I can actually go out and do this. And I don't need that, you know, that guy in the back with the laser pointer. From there, uh, I say things like, okay, we use these two stars. Remember which two, because you don't care about the handle. Ignore that. Uh, and they're going to help you find. I expected an answer with this group. But they very good. They're going to help you find the North Star. They're going to help you find Polaris. And the, the modern planetarium. So these are the kinds of things we can expect. I'm going to show you a few other things that you expect uh, in a planetarium. But we have some benefit over traditional planetariums being digital. Uh, there is some drawbacks, of course, but there are, of course, I'm going to focus mostly on the benefits because that's what we've got. Uh, one of the benefits is that we can kind of add some effects to the sky that traditionally would have been very difficult. So this, of course, you can do with an optomechanical star ball. I am increasing the, the speed of time here, right? The flow of time, just to demonstrate to folks that the North Star doesn't move. And again, this is nothing new, but we can also, we can keep track of this motion if I'd like to keep track of how the sky seems to move. And so then it becomes very clear, even again, even to young children, that, well, most of the sky seems to move. And we, of course, go through the fact that it seems to move because we all live on a gigantic spinning ball, right? So we go through all that. And then I say, but look, the North Star isn't moving at all. But we can do more than that, even. We can say, okay, let's look at this star over here in the West. And let me go ahead and throw up our cardinal points. Uh, let's look at this particular star and let's use our powers of prediction. And it started here and I tracked it for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half. It ended up down here. If you continue that path, where do you expect to see that particular star set on the horizon? Yeah, very, yeah, you're one step ahead of me there. Yeah, very good. And of course, at first, people will say West. And I'll say, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Is it, you, do you mean West, right? This is due West. What else? And, you know, you get them to realize that not everything sets due West. It's a little bit Northwest. And then you say, okay, we're going to do that same thing. But this time, let's use this star. Where is that star going to set? And again, you just you just let people sort of work it out for themselves. Um, and, and we're having this kind of conversation and we're sort of leading people to these realizations. With this visual that we have here, um, it becomes obvious that some stars and, and why some stars never leave the sky because they're physically pretty close to the North Star, right? Uh, and so this is something that uh, the planetarium really, when you if you give it enough thought, uh, one of the things that it's really good at is taking things that seem very complex, that are actually, of course, very simple, very simple ideas. But because of our limited perspective and our limited ability to visualize this, usually, you know, you, my stars in my sky don't leave these nice trails. Uh, they're difficult for us to sort of get in our heads. But when we have a nice visual like this, uh, it's obvious to everyone. Then, then you can talk about how they, because they live in Michigan, they can always find the Big Dipper because the Big Dipper is circumpolar. It never sets below the horizon, right? And often I'll ask people in my shows, I'll ask for specific questions, and I'll I'll do that at the end of this one because I don't I, I can imagine this group could easily derail me. But uh, you can uh, you can predict. Uh, especially depending on when you ask, right? I, I might stop the, the show there and say, does anyone have any questions at this point? And it's very common for someone to say, well, why, right? Why doesn't the North Star move? And again, the planetarium helps us out there because we can say, you know what? That's an excellent question. I'm going to put up a circumpolar ring. So I'm going to put up a ring that is going to demonstrate to us uh, what uh, is currently circumpolar in our sky. And now we're going to take the planetarium and we're going to move the building we're in, and we're just going to go up to the North Pole. And as we go up to the North Pole, 
Uh, watch what a couple different things for me. Watch the position of the North Star and also watch what happens uh, to that circumpolar ring as we take our planetarium and we just slide it up to the North Pole. And of course, this isn't a surprise to anyone in this room, uh, but the North Star has gone much, much higher in the sky. And now that circumpolar ring seems to fill the sky. When I started, this direction was north. What direction is it now? South. Uh, what direction is behind you now? Also south, right? Yeah. Every If you're on the North Pole, every direction around you, anywhere you walk, you're going to be heading more south than you are right now. So if every direction is south and things rise in the east, as we've seen a few minutes ago, uh, where do things rise on the North Pole? They don't. That's right. Again, this is a question that really stumps a lot of people, right? Because so there's two possible answers. One is that it rises in the south, right? Because that's, that's the only you got. Or it doesn't rise at all. And then you speed up time again and you demonstrate to everyone that, it, yeah, in fact, this doesn't, uh, nothing seems to, well, you know, once a year something rises, but uh, nothing seems to rise, nothing seems to set. And again, you can get people to realize, well, now you are on the top of that big spinning ball. So of course, as it spins, it doesn't carry you around it anymore like we're used to. Normally it's carrying us around it as it spins. Now our body just spins with it and everything in the sky seems to go around like a carousel. And what's directly over your head when you're on top of the spinning earth? The North Star. That's why the North Star never seems to move. So again, these kinds of concepts are a lot easier to wrap our heads around if we could just jump around space, right? Speaking of jumping around space, another great thing about uh, modern planetariums uh, is that we are not, and this is another big benefit over optomechanical star balls, which again, it feels like I'm kicking them, right? I, I appreciate those wonderful machines because they do offer beautiful star fields, right? They still have a place today. A lot of planetariums, if they can afford it, they do both, right? You put in a brand new star ball, which are crazy expensive, and you put in a digital system because then you get the best of both worlds. But uh, another nice thing is we're going to spin around and face south. I apologize if anyone gets dizzy. I got to turn us around here. Uh, planets aren't in the north, right? You never see a planet in the north part of your sky. So, or at least not very far in the north part of your sky anyway. Um, so planets are another great thing that we have uh, in in uh, modern, uh, of course, again, we had these with with old style uh, planetariums as well. We have, that's Pollux, what am I doing? This is Mars over here. Uh, we have Venus and we have Mars in the sky tonight, right? This is, of course, uh, quite late. This planet, my planetarium, I have it set up so it always turns on exactly two hours after whenever sunset happens to be on that particular day. Uh, was, there's only one other person with a walkie in this building right now, so I'm expecting that was for me. Security is hopefully not trying to get a hold of me, but I'll leave that on there. Okay, um, where was I? Venus and Mars were over there in the West. I was talking about that. Oh yeah, two hours after sunset, because that's of course when it is really dark, right? And that time will change depending on what time of year it is. As we get close to the summer solstice, you can see two hours after sunset is kind of miserably late. Uh, this time of year, you have to stay up pretty late to see things like Venus and Mars. We can make them nice and big. I can demonstrate to the public that I know what I'm talking about, right? That I, I'm not just showing, I'm not just pointing at random things and telling them it's planets. So Venus and Mars are over there. And you, I can also, we can show off that uh, you know, if you don't want to stay at like 11 p.m. some nights, honestly, it's past my bedtime, right? Like I'm in bed with my dogs at 11 p.m. sometimes. If you do, if you want to see a cool thing, you want to see a planet in the sky, Venus is your friend, right? Because Venus is the third brightest thing in the sky. After the sun and the moon, it's the brightest thing up there. And so at 9 p.m., just after the sun has set, not dark enough to see stars tonight, but you will see Venus over there in the west, right? Um, but okay, so that's again, that's we could do that since the late 50s with planetariums, right? That's not new. Uh, what we can do now, though, we're not trapped on the Earth anymore, right? An optomechanical starball shows you the sky as seen from Earth, because that's, of course, where we are. So why would we want to go anywhere else? But now we can kind of fly out into space. If I want to take a closer look at Venus, we just leave the Earth. And we fly around Venus. I have. Um, I have custom programmed an Xbox controller back here. 
uh, and I just have a little joystick and I'm flying around. I, uh, they it came with a, an Xbox controller to start with, but I didn't like the controls. I thought they were really dumb. So, so I made my own controls, which is kind of fun. Um, but Venus, uh, like, um, like most things in the system today, uh, Venus has more than one layer. So if I want to demonstrate to folks that, you know, Venus is not actually a gas, I know it looks like a gas planet, right? A lot of times people will confuse Venus and Jupiter uh, when I show it to them in the sky, because it does kind of look like a gas planet. But but with the help of some of our spacecraft, we have, of course, seen through those clouds and we can kind of get rid of them. Right? And I can show people the Venus that we don't usually get to see, the surface of Venus, which I think just in the last what, a year or so, we've, we've got some new papers about volcanic activity, maybe still being around on Venus. Right. There's over 80,000 dormant volcanoes on the surface of Venus, but it sounds like and I'm not super up to date on it, but it sounds like maybe they're not all as dormant as we thought they were, uh, which is which is pretty cool. Uh, likewise, we can fly off and uh, we can look at Mars, the other planet that's in the sky tonight, and we can demonstrate to people uh, the crazy surface features on Mars, things like Olympus Mons, uh, things like uh, the Valles Marineris uh, down there, you can see it. And of course, this is uh, we're the same distance from Mars as we were from Venus, so Mars does look a fair bit smaller. We can zoom in if we'd like to, and we can see some more detail here. We also, not every moon in the solar system, but a good majority of them, we have models for uh, the moons in the solar system too. So if I want to talk about how, well, Venus doesn't have any moons, but Mars has a couple, we can take a closer look at Phobos. Phobos is my preferred of the two. They're both very similar, of course, captured asteroids. But uh, if we get Phobos, I'm going to put it in front of Mars just so I don't lose track of it because it's really easy to lose. It's so small. It's really easy to fly right past this guy. But we can get in close enough that we can actually see that Phobos, like I said, super easy to fly past it. Uh, Phobos is small enough, of course, that it, uh, it doesn't have to be a sphere, right? Planets have so much gravity that the only shape that physics allows is an almost perfect sphere. Uh, but if you're tiny like Phobos, you get to keep your lumps. You're like a space potato, right? One of the things that I like to show off about Phobos uh, is that it is, of course, shockingly close to Mars. This is what Mars would look like in your sky if you were on the, uh, the, or near the surface of Phobos. And because it's so close to Mars, it moves very quickly. It orbits the planet every seven hours or so, right? Which is one thing, again, there's a lot of things that like, it's fun to know that intellectually. What a fun little tidbit. Uh, but in the planetarium, we can kind of experience it, right? So this is, uh, this is tonight at 1051. And I'm going to speed up time just a little. And here we are in the same position in our orbit, roughly. I'm just kind of stopping this manually. And now it's tomorrow morning at 6.30, right? By this time tomorrow, Phobos will have gone around Mars three more times. It's just wild. Um, some other cool things, some other things are, are fun to visualize in the planet uh, or in the planetarium as well. Things like Saturn's rings uh, can be visualized very well in here. Uh, of course, uh, there was a time, I forget exactly when, it was like eight years ago, something like that. There was a moment that the Earth went edge on with the rings of Saturn, and you could point a telescope at Saturn and not see any rings because they are, in fact, so thin that if you do go edge on with them, they seem to disappear from view completely. I have to do this nice and slow because it's really easy to, to miss this, but we're getting there. There you go, right? That's how razor thin the rings of Saturn really are. And we can also, let me come back up a little bit so I can see them again. We can also, we can go inside those rings and we can demonstrate to folks that, yeah, they look like a big hula hoop from a good distance, right? They look like one thing around uh, going around Saturn. But really, if we go into the rings, they're made up of millions of individual pieces. And we can visualize that in here. And we can talk about how, you know, they're so bright because they're primarily ice, primarily water ice. I'm going to speed up a little bit here because I'm going nice and slow. There we go. There are our individual pieces of the rings of Saturn. All right, so these are just fun visuals to show people, right? Uh, and we can show them this is real time. You can see the clock is there moving one second per second. This is the actual speed of the particles of the rings of Saturn. Feels really slow, of course, but you know we're, we're looking at dozens of thousands of miles across the view here. So these are still moving faster than bullets, uh, but uh, from, a, from a good distance, they look like they're moving, moving nice and slow. We can take this idea of going off the Earth one step further. 
uh, in the planetarium, right? So we can fly around and we can see the solar system, but we can also back up and demonstrate things uh, like the actual shape of constellations. So tonight you go outside at 11 o'clock and you've got Leo the lion in the sky, right? That backwards question mark that uh, is the head and mane of Leo and his back legs here. You've also got you know, the spring sort of famously is not exactly beginner friendly for, for constellations, right? You have things like Virgo, which, you know, Spica is nice and bright, but besides Spica, uh, Virgo is kind of a nightmare for, for new people trying to find constellations. Things like uh, Boetes is a little bit easier. The ice cream cone that is the shepherd of Boetes. You've got the uh, Big Dipper. You can arc to Arcturus. That's, a, you know, a very famous old saying. And then you've got this, the, the ice cream cone and the scoop here, right? So we show them that. We talk about constellations a little bit, but then I say, you know what? constellations they look a certain way from the earth we're very used to we kind of act when we go outside we kind of act like the sky is two-dimensional right we put all these drawings up there and we act like leo kind of looks and from our perspective it does it does kind of look like a lion and orion looks like a hunter and we tell these stories and we give these these patterns that we see meaning and power over our lives but if we back up into space a little bit uh, and that's what we're doing right now you can see the solar system the planets beginning to move a little bit there we're backing up, and once again, we're changing our view from somewhere besides the Earth. Uh, Digistar, which is the software that we use for our planetarium, isn't just a night sky simulator. It's really sort of a, a 3D environment and a universe simulator. Those stars are actually positioned correctly in three-dimensional space. So if I back up fast enough, you can see the constellations for what they really are. Right, those stars aren't actually next to each other out there, and so they, they look like they are from our one perspective here on the earth. That's what we get to see. Our eyes aren't far enough apart to see depth perception like this, right? Uh, but the reality and what we can use our big human brains for is to remember models and images like this, uh, and uh, and remember how some of those stars that look like they're next to each other are, in fact, very different distances away from our planet. Uh, and Leo doesn't really look like a lion, or Ryan doesn't look like a hunter. these are all human constructs. Right? We as cultures, as people, we looked up, we found patterns that reminded us of things here on the earth, and then we told stories about them and gave them that power, and we used them for things like horoscopes and stuff, even though out there in space, uh, you know, none of that is actually, uh, none of that's actually a reality. We can go even further than this, uh, and I'll have to, I'm going to reset here, because we can show folks uh, to scale the entire universe, should we want to, right? So we can hop off the earth again. My Earth just disappeared. Let me uh, let me do a full reset. Sometimes things do glitch out on me a little bit here. There we go. Uh, we can show them the planet they live on. We ask them to wave to themselves as they uh, as they sit there looking at their their own back. Right, we're on the other side of the world there, and we just start backing up. Uh, we talk about what an astronomical unit is, because, of course, if we're going to be using the unit right there in front of us, we should probably talk about what that is. Um, and I mentioned how, you know, things like miles out in space, of course, miles are meaningless, right? The moon being about 240,000 miles away, that's about how far a car goes before it gives up on you. You've got a high mileage car, you should really appreciate that thing because it's just about driven to the moon. But the moon out in space, 240,000 miles or thereabouts, because, of course, it's not a perfect circle. The orbit changes a little bit, but uh, about 240,000 miles uh, that out in space is meaningless right it's still we haven't gone anywhere by going to the moon the sun by comparison 0 0.24 million miles to the moon and 93 million miles just to get to our very own star and already we're at a number that's meaningless right 93 million miles i have no concept of what that looks like so instead let's make up a whole new unit because why not we've made up all the rest of them uh for the most part and uh we'll say that the distance to the sun is one Right, one. We'll take 93 million miles and we'll turn it into one, one astronomical unit. That's what we define that to be. We are currently, as two astronomical units, we're about twice as far away as the sun is. Uh, the inner solar system shows up there. This is another thing that we can. Uh, the solar system also, the the fact that we call part of it the inner and part of it the outer becomes a lot more obvious when you look at it to scale. Right, those first four planets are really quite crowded uh, there in the center part of the solar system. We talk to people about how far we've actually gone. That's the Pioneer spacecraft in yellow and the Voyager 1 in green. And so we can show people, you know, when we talk about us being a spacefaring civilization, you know, that's sort of true, uh, but we haven't really gone all that far yet, right? Even our very furthest, the Voyager, the furthest man-made object in space, we're going to see in a moment, is not really very far at all. The Kuiper Belt, some trans-Neptunian objects came into view there. And again, I usually go into a little bit more detail uh, with other folks, but I'm just assuming there's a... Sort of base knowledge here. My apologies if I'm 
making a rash assumption there. The Oort cloud comes into view, which is more or less uh, the, the true extent of our solar system, right? This is sort of the very furthest stuff still orbiting our sun, because if you get too far away, about a light year is the radius of, of the Oort cloud. If you get further than about a light year away, then you start getting to the point that you are sort of in between gravity wells of stars and eventually, of course, closer to some other star. And so you would start orbiting it instead of the sun. So that's kind of the, the real edge of, of our solar system. Some confirmed exoplanets come on next. There's going to be some little blue circles that come into view here. There we go. Those are just the confirmed ones, right? There's a lot more candidates of exoplanets that we have, but these are the ones that we're sure about. Uh, and um, in some cases, uh, this is one way that I've really, you can, nowadays you can really convince the public these are real because in, in a few cases, and this is not the prominent way we detect them, of course, but in a few cases we have actual pictures, right? Just like visible light images of planets going around other stars. Those are just the case with some of the closer ones and some of the bigger ones, but it is true that in a few cases we just have pictures. Um, so they're definitely there. Of course, other methods like the radial method or the transit method are still much more common uh, and convincing to most of us in the room. But for the public, uh, you know, if you don't understand what's happening there with the, the, the wobble of the star being pulled on by the gravity of a planet, or if you don't understand the dimming of the star from the planet passing it, that's a little bit less convincing than just here's a picture of an actual planet going around some other star. That's the radio sphere, which is, of course, a lot of fun because humans have been broadcasting radio signals for about 100 years, which means that the first radio signals uh, of humanity are now about 100 light years away. And so uh, anything further than this, mo this point in space uh, is... Um, uh, it's impossible no humans are here, right? Because our furthest signals haven't gotten any further than this. The only part of the universe that knows, could potentially know about humans uh, is the part inside of that bubble. And as we continue to back up, the radio sphere kind of shrinks away and now we get the Milky Way in the sky. The Milky Way, the band of light that we see uh, in our sky, if you go somewhere dark enough, is, of course, your galaxy, right? It's the galaxy we're all inside of right now, hosting an estimated 300 billion stars. Depending on whose estimate you listen to, it might be as low as 200 or as high as 400 billion, but I kind of take a middle ground. 300 billion stars is about 20 school buses filled with cupcake sprinkles. If you're trying to picture 300 billion stars, that's your best bet, at least the best I've uh, come across. Um, and that gives you an idea of how massive this thing is. And of course, when we experience it, because we're inside of it, it looks a lot like this. It's a band of light going across our sky. If we could somehow get outside of the Milky Way, it'd be a lot easier to appreciate it. For And of course, we can't, right? Because again, the Voyager way in there, not even close to the next star yet. It'd be a lot easier to appreciate this for what it is, though, because we could just change our perspective a little bit. And now it becomes very clear that what it really is is a galaxy, just like all the other galaxies out there in space. Uh, it's easy to take pictures of other galaxies. Of course, we don't have any pictures of our own from the outside looking in because we don't have any cameras uh, this far away. This, uh, it surprises a lot of people to learn that this was uh, what we thought the entire universe was until like 100 years ago. Right? That's how recent these discoveries, some of these discoveries have happened, because it wasn't until the 1920s when a guy named Edwin Hubble, a lady named Henrietta Swan Leavitt, and a group of other people taught us that some of the things that we used to think were inside of this, which again, was at the time the universe, or were completely separate from it. And it wasn't until the 20th century, just 100 years ago, that basically overnight, we finally started to appreciate the universe for what it really is, a collection of billions of other galaxies, just like the Milky Way. In some cases, bigger, in some cases, smaller, but, you know, roughly about like the milk here. This is the local cluster right here. We've done a lot of deep sky surveys at this point in history, so we looked a lot further out into space. This is one of the deep sky surveys that we've done. Every one of those dots there is a, is a, a, a galaxy. This is not, unlike the number of stars in the Milky Way, this isn't an estimate. Every one of those dots has an image of a galaxy uh, to go with it. Uh, and this is just one of the one of the deep sky surveys that we've done. And so every one of those dots now is uh, on average about the size of the Milky Way. Again, there, are, of course, are some quite a bit smaller and some quite a bit larger, but we seem to be a pretty typical sort of mid ranged uh, galaxy. This is usually where I stop things for most public shows because I point out that this is the universe that we know of it as far as physical structures like stars and galaxies, right? Because that's kind of what it's easy to wrap our head around those ideas. But of course, the the, the observable universe does go a lot bigger than this still. Uh, the cosmic background microwave radiation with uh, a radius of about 45 billion light years uh, makes all those galaxies seem quite small as well. This is the we're now outside of the observable universe. So, and you can see how many how many years it would take to get back to the Earth if you were moving at the speed of light. 
about 45 billion or, or so. Um, so uh, that's just uh, showing off a little bit of the, the sort of um, newer things that we can do uh, just with the push of a few buttons and we can program a lot of other things as well. One of the other nice things about Digistar specifically is it has it has its own cloud. So anyone else out in the rest of the world using a Digistar system can make something and then share it to all other um everyone else running a Digistar and I can, so I've got a friend over in Grand Rapids, his name is John Farish, who when they first took the picture of M87's black hole, right? He did this for a Sagittarius A star as well, but I prefer this one. So I'm going to show you this one too, uh, because I, I like the, the visuals a little bit better. And he said, okay, well, let's try to show people why this is so impressive, why this fuzzy picture of an orange ring is such a thing to marvel at. Let's show them what a tiny, tiny part of the sky this really actually takes up. So he said, okay, this black hole is in this part of the sky. I'm going to start by just blowing that up a little bigger just so we can see this. And now we as a group of people are going to zoom in until we're looking at such a tiny part of the sky that we can actually see the portion of the sky that is taken up by that image. There's like six different points when you think it's done, isn't it? Uh, and so it just shows you what a tiny, tiny part of the sky these images are coming from and why we need telescopes effectively the size of the world, right? Because that's basically what they did. They networked a bunch of telescopes together to get even, a, it looks like a really poor resolution picture, right? But when you realize how far into, into space you're looking, uh, it becomes a lot more impressive. And that, what I just showed you there, I did absolutely no work for, right? My friend over in Grand Rapids decided to put it together. I downloaded it, and then that was it. That was it. It took me all of five minutes to get that on the system. So it's wonderful uh, that planetariums are now able to just kind of share things um, with each other. We can, of course, simulate the future as well. One of uh, about six months into my position here, my, my director uh, took me aside and she uh, does her job phenomenally well. Any of you that know Amy know that she does her job phenomenally well, uh, but she's not a planetarium person. She's not necessarily an astronomy person. So six months into the, into the position, I got an email from Amy uh, saying, okay, so there's, and this is in her credit, this was a couple of years ago, right? This was like 2022. Uh, I just learned there's, a, there's an eclipse coming in April of 2024. We should plan something for it. And I said, okay, Amy, that's great. You're only like five years behind the curve, right? Like we've all known about this eclipse for since like 2016 or before. Um, but we can show people what to expect to see. Now I've taken us all to Cleveland, Ohio, because uh, if you're still here uh, on April 8th of 2024, um, I'm sorry, because <laughs> you'll be seeing, of course, a deep partial eclipse here, which will be cool in its own right. But a total eclipse is, of course, very different. So we are now in Cleveland, Ohio, uh, April 8th of next year. Uh, and uh, look around and see if you can spot the moon because it is in the sky it'll get a little easier here as i fast forward time a little bit so i just have an inset of the sun right i just made the sun bigger so that we can all appreciate it and see it and now the moon was there the whole time but we can start to see it uh now that it gets closer to the surface of the sun right we are of course in a new moon phase which most of the time means it's more or less invisible in the daytime sky but when it starts blocking that crazy bright thing it gets a little bit easier to tell uh where the moon is so we can talk to people about, uh, you know, eclipse safety. Any partial moment of this eclipse is not at all safe to look at unless you're using very special eclipse glasses. Regular sunglasses, of course, are not going to do it for you. But when you do finally have those two minutes or so of totality, at this point, it is safe to look at the sun, but you do need to be very careful. And again, I'm preaching to the choir here because by the time this moon starts moving away from the sun again, your eyes have dilated to adjust to this dark view, and now you're still staring at the surface of the sun. That's why that's particularly dangerous. Um, but as long as you know how long it's going to last and you time it well this is perfectly safe to look at the only time that we get to see the corona of course is during a total eclipse coming up next year and you can of course also see so the the planets in the sky you can see some of the brighter stars in the sky during a total eclipse very cool i was fortunate enough to, to catch the 2017 uh eclipse so I'm, I'm doing my best not to miss my family actually is in um this is getting a little personal but they're in carbon my, my parents live in carbondale illinois which if you look at the the path of the 2017 they're on the total the path of totality and if you look at the 2024 they're also on the path of that that x that those two make it crosses right in carbondale so i just go visit my parents and uh and i get to see both eclipses but of course with april southern illinois i'm hoping for not clouds but we shall see um 
Okay, I think that's about, uh, oh, and of course, the other thing that we can do, and this is less planetarium-esque, but the other thing that we can do uh, is we can run films that are sort of more in line with the rest of the museum. When it does come up, um, we can show things uh, like a, we have a movie called Sea Monsters. There is upstairs, there is a massive, uh, for me, massive, I mean, it's not compared to a lot of things, but a massive fossil. I'm going to turn the volume down so I don't have to talk yeah, over here. Exactly. A massive fossil of a Dolly Corinne cops, which is a late Cretaceous uh, underwater marine reptile. Uh, we also have a film uh, all about uh, the Dolly Corinne cops, and I'm just going to skip ahead here so we can just kind of see uh, sort of the, the other things that modern planetariums can do. We can sort of act like, uh, and I, I can't officially use the term IMAX because I don't pay them any royalties, but it's very similar to that kind of uh, to that kind of experience, right? Um, and so while we do, uh, because we are a planetarium, we do still mostly do astronomy content. We are capable of doing other types of, of content in here as well, which opens up some, some doors. But that doesn't stop the young type of um, and let's see, I think, I mean, I was just, I'm just kind of, um, uh, to some extent, I'm just sort of winging that. A lot of times I'll prepare talks if I'm going somewhere else, but when you have sort of the home field advantage and I, I have all this stuff that I already usually talk about anyway, I'm just kind of looking through at the kinds of things that we do uh, and discussing them. So I, this is probably a good moment. Uh, does anyone have any questions for me? I'll see. The audio, so yeah, actually I could, um, I could, uh, let me, I'll throw uh, sea monsters back up there actually. And, uh, and I'll just keep the audio up this time. Um, cause there is, uh, we have a five, one, uh, very impressive, uh, surround sound, which, um, for, uh, star talks and things, I usually just put some nice, uh, ambient music behind it, but, uh, with, uh, with our feature shows here. The Hesperoid. A bird that can't fly and has a beak full of sharp teeth. Oh, you know what? There is a great moment in the show. I'll never be able to find it though. And the Styxosaurus, a distant cousin of the Dollies, with a supersized neck. An adult can reach 35 feet in length. Half of it. Nick. So you get the, I, I was I started to say there's a moment in this show that would be great for for demonstrating the audio because uh, they they uh, are uncovering fossils at a rock quarry and they explode this big cliff face right in front of you and all these rocks fall and it's a it's a grid it's a good jump scare moment in the planetarium but I'm not sure exactly when that takes place in this show so I doubt I'd be able to actually just find it on the fly but uh, yeah any other uh, questions about the planetarium. Mm -hmm. Sorry, is that what? Right. Yeah, it is actually. So it, it's it's our reality. It's not to say that it is reality. So I'll go back there really quick and because that's another question that comes up a lot um, during public shows. The question, just so the folks online can hear it too, because I think they can just hear it through microphones, uh, was when I was showing them one of the, the map of the galaxies that I had on the dome a moment ago. Um, and it looked like uh, a nice bow tie because the universe turns out just loves bow ties. Um, is that a reality? Do we actually have two cones of, of, uh, of galaxies out there? Um, and the answer to the, to, the, to the question that I just posed, do, do we only have two cones of galaxies, is no. But those, as promised, I was only showing you the stuff we've actually seen. And it turns out that we still have, when we're looking at, when we're talking about deep sky surveys, we still have blind spots because of where our telescopes are. So if I back up, so these are what we're talking about here. Uh, it looks like the universe is hourglass shaped. When we look out at depths, we have lots of galaxies in this direction and lots in this direction. And then it seems like there's nothing here and there's nothing here. And the reason for that is because the telescopes that we use to get, because of course we've never been there. We just take pictures of things that are crazy far away. The telescopes that we use to get those images are of course themselves all inside of the Milky Way galaxy. And the galaxy we live in poses problems for trying to see out of it in certain directions. I'll get back in here. So 
this is us. Uh, if you'd like to, if you're still waving to yourself, you aim over here. Um, so that's, that's the galaxy that we're in right now. And so when we do deep sky surveys, if we point our telescopes this way, like, oh, wow, wonderful. Look at all that stuff. Amazing. And then stuff down here too. Oh, wow. It's all over the place. But then if we point our telescopes this way or this way, we have problems, right? Because we have stars and gas and dust within the plane of the Milky Way that sort of blocks our view of deep sky surveys in those other directions. So there's very probably stuff there, but I wasn't showing it to you because we, we haven't seen anything in those directions. No, thanks for the question. I appreciate it. Any, anything else about uh, anything I talked about or just the planetarium in general, if anyone's curious? Hmm? I do. <laughs> How does that work is the, is the question? Yeah, so so there is, um, and so of course that's part of the job too. I I attended um, as, as uh, someone mentioned at the start there that I I'm uh, very fortunate to be a um, a uh, uh, what do they call that thing? <laughs> the, the the a fellow. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I should probably know uh, a fellow of the Great Lakes Planetarium Association, which is very they were very generous. They don't usually give that out so freely. So very fortunate to have that this early. Um, but anyway, so I attend conferences, planetarium conferences, and one of the things that they do at planetarium conferences is they show off their, like they have people peddling their wares, right? People showing off all their new toys and things. And there's always this, this, um, this uh, uh, sort of balance between, and I'm going to throw up a grid here, between um, getting the very best looking thing and using too many projectors because there is a blend line between the two. There are three different computers that control the system you're, you're, work, you're seeing. One computer just controls what I'm doing. I have what we call the host computer and it takes all the commands and things and sends them out. We have a second computer we call GP1 that just controls this rear projector. And we have a third one that just controls the front projector. There are also, if after the show, if you'd like to get up and look around, there are uh, four infrared lasers underneath of this projector here. There's also two webcams here that monitor where it, where it's throw where it thinks it's throwing versus where it's actually throwing. And I can make adjustments to that digitally uh, without having to actually physically adjust things, which is wonderful. It used to take hours to do that, um, but now it just takes a few minutes. And uh, same thing in the back. I've got those same sort of monitoring devices in the back. And uh, if you look closely at uh, certain parts, so it's not perfect right now. So as an example, down here by the 90 and by the sort of in-between, you can see some what we call doubling, where the projectors are not actually through. They think that they are, but they're not actually throwing in exactly the same place. And if you if you let that go too much, so my doubling, when it's this close to the horizon, I don't worry about it very much. If that doubles, so everything with this tight grid is where there's overlap. Both projectors are actually hitting that same spot. Um, so if they think they're throwing in the same place but aren't, you'll end up with two stars because one will, you know, both of them are throwing that star right there. Um, and because they're throwing in the same spot, uh, it, uh, it's, not, it's not crucial. But if they miss each other, you get, uh, it's difficult to talk about constellations because, you know, suddenly there's two reguluses in the sky and you're sort of, uh, you're adding some, some misnomers into people's beliefs. But if the guy running the planetarium does a good job of maintaining it, then you don't notice that, right? So yeah, there is what we call a blend line right here. Um, but it's very difficult, unless you're really practiced at looking for them, it's very difficult to spot them. Um, it does get easier to spot them when there are bright scenes. So uh, for instance, let me see if I can't, uh, oh, you know what, I'll, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go over here. Um, so if I throw up, like a, if I make the projectors throw a solid color, it becomes a lot more obvious because uh, one of the nice things about a planetarium is that most of what I'm throwing is black. So it's really hard to see those, uh, those uh, inconsistencies between color and brightness and, and positioning and things. But if we have it throw up like a pure blue screen, actually, that's not bad, man, I'm impressing even myself. There is a little bit of a dark patch right here. You can see it's not quite perfect there. But that's not a bad, that's not a bad blend line. I'm going to brag about myself a little bit. And again, with the greens, you can see there's a little bit of a dark patch there. So there is some, um, some, uh, and sorry to blind everyone. I know I just ruined everyone's night vision. Uh, but so, yeah, there is a bit of a, a technical expertise that's required for running modern planetariums too. You have to kind of know about those things. Yeah. Yeah. Good question. Thanks for that.
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a fair point. And that, that's another, so anyone running it, cause it's a fairly small, you know, the, there's one full-time person that does this planetarium and you're, you're talking to him uh, other than and that's pretty typical. Right. And so other than that, we have a lot of, we're, I'm very fortunate that I have a lot of part-time student presenters that sort of take some of the show presenting off of my hands. But um, in terms of like decision-making that kind of thing um, there's not a whole lot of excess uh, staff and facility here and to, to their credit or to, to, to defend them, um, Part of it, part of another hat that you have to wear as a manager is the sort of budgetary hat. Um, and so the reality is that uh, like a light show, you're right. Like it doesn't, uh, it's not on mission, right? That's the lingo that we would use in sort of a, um, an informal education facility, right? The mission of the planetarium, as I've mentioned, is to educate more people about the night sky and about their own autonomy with nature and, and science in general. But if I, if we don't stay open, then we're not helping anybody, right? Like if I can't, if I can't pay to keep this building open, then that's not good. So a lot of places will, and, and sometimes they, they go over the top, right? Cause if you're doing it in place of star talks, then what's the point? But a lot of places will offer evening shows that are just light shows. Right. And the reason they do that is because a lot of, especially matinees or evening star talks, you know, you might get a dozen people through the door, maybe if on a good Saturday night, maybe two dozen people through the door, a light show is going to sell out just about every time, right? So you're just, you're, you're getting fiscally, you're getting a lot more uh, in there for that, for that reason. So most planetariums that do run light shows do it specifically because they know they're going to bring in the money and they can use that to then keep the doors open basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we uh, we actually we do. Uh, that's sort of a reward for uh, staff and presenters here. We do run movies in here, um, but doing it publicly, it actually most unless you're a movie theater and you're making a lot of money from concessions, you actually lose money on the on the Hollywood move running the Hollywood movies. So like for for us, it would cost us about five hundred dollars per screening to run a Hollywood film. And so I'd have to sell sell out i'd have to charge ten dollars a seat and sell out every show just to break even so it becomes tough to sell uh, unless you're selling a lot of popcorn and, and and pizza and whatever uh it becomes tough to do that and make money so um it sort of depends on what, so it, just doing it on the fly um, would be a little bit tough. Let me uh, give you a, a good example. Yeah, and so that's, there's, um, doing it in the moment, it's not the most user-friendly, but what is nice about this, uh, the, Dig the Digistar software, so this is uh, an example of uh, a few different, I put this together about, it was a while ago, about the position of different types of asteroids, All right, so this is the different types of asteroid orbits, um, yeah, and so there you've got the colors and things, so if you know ahead of time that there's something you want to talk about, it is pretty easy to, you can even make custom ones if you want to, right? If the system doesn't have a certain object that I want to have in it, I can go in and say, okay, I want this object to have this radius. I want it to have this orbital pattern. I want it to have this eccentricity and this albedo, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so, yeah, and, and so you can make your own, but you have to know that ahead of time because you do a little bit of pro, you know, a little bit of coding. It might take you a couple hours to make that, but then after you've made it, you can attach it to a button because that's mostly what I've done right here. I have a little, um, actually, I could grab my, uh, hold, give me a moment. I'll grab an iPad because uh, I can show you the buttons that I'm using. Uh, you can attach it to a button. And then in the future, every time you wanted to talk about it, you just push that button and it would, it would do it for you. So this is a script about asteroids that I made a good while ago. And now anytime I want to talk about asteroids, I can push that button and it just does it for me. Yeah. So also anything that I, we make now, we can also tie anything that I make on that computer, this iPad duplicates. So this here, and I'll just kind of walk it around is the control panel pages that I use. Right. So when I want to go to, for instance, um, if I want to go to, actually, I should probably reset here. Um, so you'll see that it's going to bring us back to a regular night sky. If I want to go to um, Mimas, right? I have a button right here that says Mimas, and I just I push Mimas, 
right? Um, and so I can make buttons. So this is my solar system button page. Um, yeah, and so we, all I did is I pushed a button on an iPad and it took me to Mimas, right? Uh, and I can program buttons to take me or to do anywhere that I want to go. Uh, from this point, the motion that you were seeing earlier was when I grabbed the, um, the, the Xbox and then I was using the joysticks to kind of fly around. So there's a couple, I mean, so there's a couple ways that you can do it. There are some objects, and this is pretty, if you're talking about something as specific that's not actually already on the system, then probably um, NASA doesn't have any imagery of it. Because if NASA has imagery of it, it's probably a big enough deal that it's already on the system. I wouldn't have to make it. So the majority of things that if uh, if I'm trying to make my own separate little comet or whatever, and, and I, I don't have images for it, what I can do is I can take, for instance, like we're looking at Mimas here. And if I wanted uh, to show everyone, uh, you know, the Death Star moon somewhere else, too, which right now we're, it looks like we're hold on, I'll speed up time. For those of you that don't know why it's called the Death Star moon, we'll demonstrate that really quickly here. Um, what I can do is I can effectively like duplicate some other object, right? So if I expect it to look like Ceres, or if I expect it to look maybe like Sharon, like like Pluto's moon, I can take that that imagery of that object and I can make a duplicate of it and then change the size of it to the appropriate size. And so you basically, actually, that's um, I'll, I can demonstrate what I'm talking about uh, in just a moment. Let me see if I can't find my speed up time controls. I'm a terrible multitasker, so I usually, if I'm talking, I'm not doing. To try and get around to the sunny side here. Somewhere on this moon, there is a crater that is the namesake of this of this moon. Oh, there's an eclipse. Eclipses are there. It is. Yep. That's why it's the Death Star moon. There's this one big crater that makes it kind of look like the Death Star. Uh, anyway, so so as an example, one of the things that I did, I liked, I have a, a one. Of the, so we have grad students that do some of the talks here, and one of them was studying uh, or is studying um, the cellar evolution, right? She studies um, you know the different life cycles that that stars go through, and so one of the things that I made for her because I, for our live talks, I like to give our presenters some autonomy. I make, I, I have a few rules. I say when you give a star talk, you have to, at some point, talk about the Big Dipper and the North Star. And you have to talk about at least a couple of seasonal constellations, and you have to talk about any planets that happen to be in the sky at reasonable hours that night. And the reason I have those three rules is because if you go to a planetarium, you should get some information that you can take home and play with, right? Like us showing them all these cool things that I've shown you, it only goes so it doesn't do them a lot of good because then when they go outside and they say, yeah, now I've seen how big the universe is, but I still don't know anything over my head, right? So those are the three things that everyone talks about. After that, they're allowed to talk about whatever they want to. And so this person uh, studies, uh, studies stars. And so I made a size comparison. And what I did, so this is Gliese 229a. The system doesn't have a model for Gliese 229a. That's just a red dwarf star. So what I did was I took the sun, I duplicated it. I changed the, the radius of the, my new fake sun to be the appropriate radius for Gliese 229a. And then I changed the color. Right to be a red red dwarf star, and so then here is the size of our sun by comparison. This is what Sirius looks like, which again is actually just a duplicate of the. I don't tell the public this, but it's a duplicate of the sun that is the correct radius and color. This is Pollux, Arcturus, Aldebaran, Rigel, Deneb, Antares, Betelgeuse. These are all also, you might, if you're familiar with the sky, you might recognize every one of those names because I picked intentionally stars that you can just go outside without a telescope and find, right? Every one of those stars is a very bright, prominent star in the sky that you can just go out and see. The exception to that is these last two stars are candidates for the largest known star. That's VY Canis Majoris. That's UI Scuti. There's a bunch of other candidates too, because there's a lot of error bars uh, for these kinds of the exact size of these kinds of stars. Um, so those two, you would need a powerful telescope to find. But uh, but the rest of the stars, again, I picked on purpose because I wanted people to be able to go out and find them. And all of these are just duplicate suns that I've changed the radius and color of. Yeah, that one always gets good reactions too. All right, I think I've got about another uh, five minutes or so. I so our um, for those of you that parked in Palmer, we have the Palmer uh, elevator is going to be unlocked until nine thirty. So I don't want to like let out 
at 9 30 because then you won't have time to get over there and, and use the elevator um but uh but we've got a little bit of time Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, like deep sky objects. Yeah. So I do. Um, a, a, another thing that I've done is I've for each for each season, I have pre programmed about a dozen or so good deep sky objects for that particular season for telescopes. And so a lot of times I'll show people uh, during the sort of night sky portion. I don't necessarily zoom into them, but I bring up an image and make it and, and put position the image so that it's where they would actually see it. So the Orion Nebula. Uh, you know, we can bring that up so we can show people with the Orion. And I also, I give people a warning because one of the things that happened to me, especially when I was like early college, people were, I went to a planetarium show, they were showing me all these wonderful things. And then I went to observing nights expecting to see that, right? And that's the problem, right? So I try and tell you, that's what you get if you spend a billion dollars on a government space telescope called the Hubble. Uh, if you go out in your own backyard with a, with a telescope, you can see the Orion Nebula, right? It's not the most difficult thing to find, but don't expect to see that, right? Because that's... Uh, that's very different. Uh, and we've got um, a lot of it. So right now, the springtime uh, is, of course, galaxy season. So we've got uh, a lot of galaxies that come up in the springtime, the Whirlpool, Sombrero, Sunflower Galaxy, or the Black Eye Galaxies up this time of year, too. Oh, the Leo, of course, the Leo triplets up, too. Yeah. So yeah, we can also, uh, you know, as if we do get, if I have, if I have a sense that I have people who are interested in doing some of their own observing uh, or, uh, you know, some astrophotography or something, we can show those things off. And in some cases, we do also have things called volumetric models, uh, which can actually fly us out to those. So for instance, I think the Orion Nebula is one that we do have. Uh, yeah. So this is uh, a volumetric model of um, the Orion Nebula. We can actually fly out there and see uh, three-dimensionally the, the shape and the um, sort of what, what uh, the Orion Nebula looks like out there in, out there in space. And so we can, I think I can use my Xbox controller for this. Yeah, so we can orbit around this. <laughs> yeah it's easy to, to stay late that's for sure <laughs> yep yeah it doesn't and there's not a whole lot of volumetric models on the system like this but there are a few and they are pretty cool to to go out and check out Yeah, I really, to be honest with you, so I do a fair bit of 3D modeling and some production as well, and I honestly don't know how they make these these volumetric models like this. It blows my mind. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> Actually, I've got some. I've got some space. Um, that's another thing about. So we uh, we run planetariums have different uh, different uh, resolutions, and ours is a 2K resolution so the the planetarium has 2500 by 2500 pixels across it a lot of planetariums have 4k uh and so with 4k resolution i filled up my drives in my last planetarium real fast one of the nice things about it being a little bit smaller in here because again it's this is what i would consider to be a small planetarium um which people have different opinions about but uh is that i do have a lot more hard drive space than i did in my big planetariums <laughs> which is good that, yeah, I, I have found that the, the the space itself. So I used to have a rule at my last planetarium because I was at Longway in Flint, uh, and Longway is the largest planetarium in the state of Michigan. It's a it's a 16 meter or 52 foot dome, and so I had a rule for my presenters in my last one that they had to use the iPad and they had to be out in the room walking around because if you were in the console in that room, you felt very detached. And it, when I first started here, I had the same rule, but then I quickly realized that you can be back in this console and you're still like six feet from people. So it does. It feels a lot more intimate and you get a lot more sort of conversational shows which is kind of nice <laughs> no i looked i didn't oh um oh can someone <laughs> uh, sorry someone did just uh oh quite a while ago actually i'm sorry i missed that uh asked me to mirror the image so that it's not reversed on zoom 
which hopefully for most things in astronomy didn't matter too much, but the constellations I imagine probably would have looked would have looked strange. Sorry for for everyone looking at the um, looking at the, the the images backwards on Zoom. Hopefully it didn't cause too many problems. But other than that, I don't see any any questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, we do. Um, so that's another thing that, uh, yeah, again, the stars that you see in our particular system are uh, three-dimensionally representative. So this was where those stars would position themselves if you were at uh, the Orion Nebula. Another thing we can do, so one of the shows that I recently developed for um, high school students uh, is called Big History, where we talk about the history of the universe. Uh, and I do that thing that uh, Sagan and then later... Um, uh, Tyson did, where we shrink the, the history of the universe into a calendar year. And I actually, we start the show by asking the kids to predict where they think six things happened. I asked them to predict where they think the sun happened if the, you know, if the uh, universe existed for a year. And I, we actually position it, uh, you know, wherever they guess as a group. And we drop it down. And so there's a bunch of other things I ask. But uh, the, the the way this show finishes, is I point out to them that I've been lying to them about the stars because the stars stayed put the whole time. And of course, stars, just like everything else, they, they move, right? Over a human lifetime, they don't. But if we go back even just a million years, that this is the proper motion of the stars. So I've walked them through this whole history of the universe and the dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago, which was yesterday, right? That was, if you shrink the universe into a year, the dinosaurs went extinct yesterday. That was 66 million years ago. And even just a million, we're going back a million years now, even a million years ago, the sky looked very different. And so I point out to them that when they go outside and look up at the sky, they're seeing th their sky, the sky that really only exists right now because the dinosaurs lived on the same planet but they saw a very different sky than we do. And if we're lucky enough to have ancestors a million years from now, they're going to be on the same planet, but they're going to see a very different sky. So yeah, with the, the positions of the star, anytime we're looking at the sky, uh, the positions of the stars are accurate for where we're, we are and when we are. Because <laughs> we can also, we can go back to... Um, you know, 5,000 years ago and demonstrate that the North Star wasn't always the North Star. We can show people when Vega was the North Star. That it tracks the procession of the Earth as well. Thank you all. I appreciate everyone coming out and uh, finding my place. I know it's not the easiest place to, to get into.